Okay, uh, welcome back for the last session. Uh, now that we throughout uh, the day have heard how great TLA Plus is, and everybody is now a strong believer um, in the course, Jay here will tell us areas where a different tool, Alloy, or a different methodology, Alloy, uh, might also be handy and complement uh, TLA Plus. So with that, go. All right, thank you. You got me on the mic back there? All right. So yes, I'm Jay Parlar, and I'm here to, today to tell you a little bit about Alloy, which is something similar to TLA+, but is not TLA+. Uh, I think all of you are probably in the TLA Plus Slack channel already. There's also a formal methods Slack channel, which should encompass TLA+, and, and everything else. So if you want to join, please join. All right, so this is the Alloy book. It is basically the only way to learn Alloy. For better or worse, it's a fantastic book. It's really lovely, but and it doesn't even say Alloy in the title, which I find kind of strange. So don't search Amazon for Alloy. Um, amazing book, but it's really the only way to learn. So take that, check that out after. All right. So what is Alloy? <clears throat> it's a language and tool for describing and exploring structures. And an Alloy model is a collection of constraints that describes a set of structures. And it is a logic based on relations and sets. And these are all sort of paraphrases from the Alloy website, which itself just basically tells you to buy the book. So what are the similarities to TLA Plus? Well, Alloy is a model checker. Now, I put it in quotation marks because Alloy's creator, Daniel Jackson, actually thinks of it as slightly separate than a traditional model checker. I call it a model checker, but he, he doesn't. So I put some quotes around there. Uh, and it's based on first order logic and set theory. So if you have a good handle on the math used in TLA plus, and not even like the temporal math, just for all there exists and sets, then you've got absolutely all the math you need to work with Alloy. Now, where is it different from TLA plus? Well, Alloy has no first class notion of time. And if you decide to do things with time in Alloy, this is, can be problematic. You can do it, but it is not fun to work with time like it is in TLA+. Alloy has a strong focus on relational data structures, and we'll see what I mean by that later. Alloy really likes to talk about small scope analysis, which is purposely bounding your model no matter what. TLA+, we can do that with, with constraints, uh, but in Alloy, it's sort of built in. Uh, Alloy is based on a SAT solver underneath the covers, which has some incredible benefits, also some drawbacks. Uh, it has possibly a simpler syntax. I'll say this. Everyone I've, I've introduced both TLA plus and Alloy to always say, oh, Alloy is way easier to read. The syntax is much better. I think once you learn them both, it really then becomes sort of eye of the beholder, which one you personally feel is better. But Alloy has a more familiar syntax for most people. Alloy has a visualizer. And you're going to see this. And it is an amazing, amazing thing. And it's why. I'd say why a lot of Alloy fans like Alloy. And the time to useful results in Alloy is incredibly quick. And I can't remember if it was Halal who first gave me that quote, or maybe Dan Jackson. Some, someone did. I didn't come up with that myself. But almost immediately, you can start getting useful results in Alloy. So what experiences have I had with it? Well, I've discovered subtle production security flaws requiring 13-step sequences. Uh, I invalidated someone else's large API design after they worked on it for a year. Um, I uncovered multiple structural bugs in other people's systems. Uh, I've helped developers better understand their own systems by helping them build an Alloy model. And I've helped contribute to the design of new systems with Alloy. And let me say this, like, I'm 50-50 a TLA Plus user and an Alloy user. I'm not the Alloy guy coming in here to tell TLA Plus folks they're wrong. I love them both. I'm glad I know them both. But I've done a lot of stuff with, with Alloy. All right, to help show you what Alloy is capable of, we're going to build a very simple system. Super trivial. And actually, let me thank Hillel again. He helped give me some inspiration for this. We're, I think we're all probably here because of Hillel Wayne anyway. But um, he, he helped, he helped uh, give me the inspiration for this one. So I, I want to do like a simple permission system that has accounts. And these are like customer accounts. Resources within those accounts and users. Resources and users belong to accounts. Users can optionally have direct access to a resource. That means like they have permission to access the resource. So they have some role on the resource. Resources can optionally have a parent resource. And why would we want that? Well, in this particular system, 
I want to say that users should automatically be able to access the children of resources that they already have access to. So if you can access a parent, you should automatically get, you should automatically have permission to access the parent's children. All right, I've talked for four minutes and 45 seconds. Let's actually see what Alloy looks like. So this is a tool. Is that font big enough for the people in the back? I can make it bigger. So it's OK? I see some people squinting. I will make it bigger. Is that good? All right. If it's not, please shout out. So this is the Alloy IDE. Uh, it comes out of MIT. Dan Jackson is a prof there. And what I've got is the beginnings on the left side here of the design of this system. All right, now, right now, I have almost nothing there. I have SIG account, SIG user, and SIG resource. SIG, you can think of like a class or a type definition. So basically, at this point in time, I have told Alloy, my system is going to have three types of things. Great. I want to see something useful with that. So I'm going to click the Execute button here. And Alloy is going to say, instance found. What does that mean? What Alloy has done, do you want me to make that font bigger? Yes? All right. What Alloy has done is it has said, oh, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> Alloy has said, all right, Jay, you've told me that your system has accounts and users and resources. Here is a valid instance of your system. Here's something that's totally valid given the definition you've provided so far. I can click this button that says next. I promise you it says next. You probably can't read that in the back. Alloy will generate a brand new fresh instance for me in a different one. Here's an instance in which there are two accounts and one user. Click next again. Here's an instance in which there's two accounts, one resource, one user. Not super useful so far, but it's interesting that right away, Alloy has started to generate possible instances of this system based on the description I provided. Now let's think back to how I described things need to work here. Resources and users are supposed to belong to accounts. We see nothing on this diagram indicating any kind of ownership. So let's modify our Alloy model to tell Alloy that information. So I'm not brave enough to live code, so I've got everything broken down into separate files here. And what I just typed really, really quick was that now the account class has a resources attribute and a user's attribute. The resources attribute is going to be the set of resources that belong to this account. The user's attribute is going to be the set of users that belong to this account. The user class itself, or the user type, also has a resources attribute. This is going to be the resources the user has access to, or the, the resources the user has a permission on. And the resource class also has an attribute called parent. Remember I said a resource can optionally have a parent. So I've said loan resource. Every resource has less than or equal to one resources. That's what loan stands for, less than or equal to one. So now that I've done this, I've added a few attributes, just started to describe some structure to the system. I'm going to click Execute again. Alloy is going to start a fresh new set of instances. I'll click on Instance. Now, this is a lot more interesting, I think. Now, Alloy has generated a system that has two accounts, two resources, and one user. And there's some structure behind them. This is a valid instance of the system thus far. Now, let's, let's take a look at it. Resource 1 belongs to account 0. OK, that's cool. Resource 0 belongs to account 1. That's interesting. Our one user, though, is shown as belonging to both accounts. We probably don't want that. If you're developing a permission, like a customer account permission system, you probably don't want one user to belong to two accounts simultaneously. But Alloy doesn't know that, and we might not have thought of it. Yet Alloy has shown us a possible instance in which this can happen, given the rules of our system thus far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into Alloy, and I'm going to put a constraint on the definition. All right, and what this constraint is going to do and it's called a fact. It's going to say to Alloy, all right, from now on, for every instance you generate, this thing down here has to be true. And what does this thing say? It says that for all users U, there's going to be exactly one account A such that U is in A's set of users. All right? So for every, every user, there's going to be one account that the user belongs to. So this is, not, this is going to disallow that instance that we just saw. And now if I click Execute, tap on this, and there we go. So we no longer have that situation we just saw. Here's a fresh instance that Alloy has generated for us. Again, two resources, two accounts, one user. 
but it, it's better. It's solved that user problem. And I could click next thousands of times, and we would no longer see a case where two accounts are sharing the same user. But I see more problems here. Right? So this is some exploration that Alloy is letting us do. Resource one belongs to account zero. Resource zero belongs to account one. But there's a parent-child relationship between those resources. Again, for a security permission system, that's probably a really bad thing for resources from two completely separate customer accounts to be linked together. It's probably a bad thing. And for this system, we'll say it is a bad thing. We didn't tell Alloy that resources have to belong to separate accounts. So it came up with an instance, a valid instance, in which that could take place. So what we need to do is we need to go further refine our description of this system to tell Alloy more rules, more constraints. So that gets added right down here. It's a new fact. And again, all, all facts have to be true. Alloy is only going to generate instances that satisfy all the facts. And this one says that for all resources R, if there's a parent on R, because remember, parents are optional. A resource doesn't have to have a parent. But if there's a parent on R, it implies there is exactly one account for which R is in that account's resources and R's parent is in that account's resources. All right, so this is, again, a way to make sure that if an account has a parent, then it and its parent belong, or sorry, if a resource has a parent, then it and its parent belong to the same account. Click Execute, start a fresh new set of instances. Here we go. So we're no longer going to have that problem we just had. I could click Next 10,000 times. It'll generate a different instance every time, but we're never going to have a case where two resources or we're a parent and a resource are in different accounts. But there's another problem that I see here. Maybe you see it as well. Resource one is its own parent. That just doesn't make sense to me. Maybe you're developing a system where that does make sense, but for the simple system I described, that doesn't make sense. But again, we didn't tell Alloy that a resource can't be its own parent. We didn't put it into our requirements, essentially. So someone who went off and tried to implement this might accidentally allow for that. So let's fix that problem. We're going to add another fact down here, which says there's going to be no cycles. And this is going to say there's, there's no resource R for which R is in its own parent chain. The, the caret here is actually the transitive closure, closure operation, which is a super powerful part of Alloy. It's built right in. Um, don't worry if you don't understand that now, but it, just know that it means a resource can no longer be its own parent. So let's execute, take a look at more instances. All right, this one's not very interesting, but at least it's valid based on everything we've seen. Let's click Next, start exploring the sorts of things that are possible. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Everything's looking pretty good. But I'm going to stop here for a second. Here's another issue. Our user, which belongs to account one, has access to resources from two separate accounts. Again, we probably don't want that. That's something we might not have thought about beforehand. But Alloy has said, hey, here's something that's totally possible. It's explored the system for us. So let's fix this problem. We've got another fact here. And it's going to say, for every combination of user and account, and this, like for all you folks that know TLA plus already, hopefully you're seeing the mapping here between the for all and TLA plus and Alloy. It's saying, for every possible combination of user and account, if the user U is in that account, then it implies that all of U's resources are in that account. All right, so this is, this is making sure that every resource a user has access to lives in the same account as the user themselves. So let's click Execute, Instance, and I could click Next, 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 Forever. I could spend the, my remaining 25 minutes clicking Next, and we're not going to see that problem again. All right, so that's, that's pretty cool, I think. But you know, we're TLA plus folks. We love invariants. We love invariant checking. Fortunately. Alloy's got us covered there as well. So in Alloy, it's called a check. And here's one I've come up with called no shared resources. Because going through these examples, we can maybe start to think about some things we forgot about. For instance, is it possible that a resource belongs to multiple accounts? I don't know. It, it might be. We haven't actually said anything about it. And what this check is, it's, it's an invariant. So it's basically saying, I believe that for every resource R, there is exactly one account that that resource belongs to. 
Okay? And because this is a check, it means I'm going to be able to do it just like in TLI plus, have, have Alloy check for me that in every possible instance, this is, this is valid or invalid. So you know, what, what do I have in mind here? I think probably it's possible for a resource itself to belong to two accounts, because we haven't said anything about that. So let's execute, do a check, counterexample found. And I'll note, it found the counterexample in three milliseconds, which like, that's pretty cool. Alloy tends to be really, really fast about this stuff because it has a SAT solver underneath. So let's take a look at this counterexample, which I'm sure is going to show a resource belonging to two accounts. Well, that's surprising. It shows a resource that belongs to no accounts. Did anybody here think of that as a possibility? Maybe some, you're all pretty smart folks, actually, probably you all thought of it, but I didn't the first time I ran this. You know, this is the, the beauty of counterexamples, and I don't need to stress that to all of you. Alloy found a case where, in fact, this resource does not belong to exactly one account. It belongs to zero accounts, and we don't want that as well. For this particular system, I think every resource should belong to an account. So how are we going to fix that? Right up here, a new fact. This looks a little bit tricky. Don't worry about it for now, but it's, it's guaranteeing that every resource is going to belong to some account. I know Hillel understands this. Other folks, if you don't, don't worry about it. So we're going to check. We still have a counterexample. Let's take a look at this. This is a nice complex one, but this is showing what I was originally thinking would happen. Resource one is belonging to two separate accounts. We don't want to allow that. That's a bad thing. So we can fix that. I'm going to add a little bit more to this fact here. And everything inside of a fact is anded together. All constraints must be true. This is saying there's no two disjoint accounts or two different accounts such that there's an intersection between their set of resources. All right, no two accounts are allowed to share any resources whatsoever. Execute that. No counterexample found. So we're good. And right away, it came back. So that's pretty nice. Uh, for the purposes of time, I'm going to skip the re I had one more example, but I can show that to you all after. I don't need to convince any of you about how good counterexamples are, because hopefully you understand it. All right. So what I really want to stress here, especially for the folks in this room, is the concept of design exploration. We were doing the counterexample checks at the end. And of course, those are amazing. We all know the power of writing a counterexample. But I want you to think back to the beginning of that model we were putting together, when Alloy was essentially exploring what's possible and showing it to us and pointing out to us things that we might not have thought about otherwise. It's really easy to write an invariant if you know the property that you want to check, but it's also really awesome to have it just show you valid things that might be weird, and then you as a human can decide. So I really like this aspect of Alloy, the fact that it enables you to explore your design at a very early stage, before you're even ready to write any invariants. OK, so relations. Why do I put this up there? Relations are the fundamental thing in Alloy. Everything is sets of relations in Alloy, absolutely everything. So let's look at this diagram again. I mean, from a diagram level, it makes sense. There's circles and, and boxes and arrows. But under the scenes, what's actually happening there? Well, we've got two accounts. We've got two resources. We've got one user. That's fine. You know, we had the SIGs for those. But what's the resources and users and parents? Like, what do those arrows actually represent at the end of the day? So a button up top there that I didn't show you is this one here. It says table for those in the back that can't read it. You can't change the font size of those buttons in Alloy, so I apologize for that. If I were to have clicked on that, Alloy would have shown me this, a tabular representation of what we just saw in the visualizer. This is 100% identical to what we were just looking at in the visualizer. Well, how? All right, so here they are side by side, just as a reminder. The top left of every table is the SIG name, or the type, or the class. So resource, user, and account. Those are the three SIGs that we defined. The other headers are the attributes for each of those SIGs. So parent, resources, resources, and users. Right? These are the attributes that we defined near the beginning when we were building up the spec. As a reminder of what the account SIG looked like, minus the comments I had in there. So then what about the actual arrows? How do we read this table? Well, this particular resources arrow that I've highlighted here is for 
an accounts resources, and in particular, it's a mapping from account one to resource one. Right? That's like visually, that's what it is. It's an arrow from account one to resource one. But behind the scenes, like tabular wise, it's a mapping from account one to resource one. And this resources up here is a mapping from account one to resource zero. If you want to think about it purely textually, resources is actually a set of tuples, where those tuples are the mappings. Account one to resource zero, account one to resource one. That's what resources actually is. That's what these attributes actually are. That's what the arrows actually represent. What about accounts, just by itself? Big A account. That's one of our SIGs, right? So what would that represent? Well, everything in Alloy is a set of relations. So account is actually the set of one tuples containing account 0 and account 1. So even just that class name by itself is represented as a set of relations. It's just one tuple relations, but that's still, that's still a relation. All right, so let's review where we're at so far. A SIG defines a class or a type, and those represent represents, uh, relations, and a relation is a set of, for a SIG, a relation is a set of one tuples, and a SIG can have attributes in it, and those represent relations where they're sets of n tuples. Now, we haven't defined any operations or actions, which, is a, which as TLA plus folks, probably hurts us to the core. We haven't talked about how users are added to an account or how resources are added. But even without those operations and actions, I think we've done some really useful things. We've defined a lot of specificity in our requirements and our design there that we might not have thought about otherwise, things we might have totally forgotten and never even written a property for. Okay, so now I want to talk about something that seems maybe disconnected, but it, it's all part of this. Relational joins. So everything in Alloy is a relation, and that means you probably want to have a join, just like you do in a database. And in fact, it's an inner join. Now, how does this look? So here's one of the facts that we had up, right? All users is one account, such as you in a.users. Well, what in the world does a.users actually mean in a tool in which everything is a set of relations? Well, that dot is actually the relational inner join operator, just like you would have in a database. It's not quite just like you'd have, very, very close, though. And we'll see how in a second. OK, so here's an arbitrary example. Let's say that foo is this set of relations, and bar is a set of relations. What then is foo.bar? Well, I've got foo written on the left in a tabular view, just like a database table, and bar on the right as a database table. And the way you work with that dot is you take the last column from the left side of the dot, and you take the first column of the right side of the dot and start doing joins. Okay, this is your join where basically foo.last column equals bar.first column. All right, so does b equal b? Yes, it does. So now we can join those two rows together. The way an alloy join works is you actually throw away the matching bit. When you join two SQL tables together, you keep the matching column in the resulting select. But in alloy, you throw that little bit away. So we start off with this. It gives us a new relation, adg. We've tossed away the b. Does that B on the left match anything else in that first column on the right? Yeah, it matches this second row, so we get another one, AEH. That's all the B matches. How about this C? What does that match? Well, it matches the C over here, so we can do another join to give us AFI. And then what about this row here? Does its last element match any first elements on the right side? Yes, it does. So we get JFI. All right, so that's what the dot actually is in Alloy. So let's look at that relative to our example. So let's focus in just on the, the account sig. What does users represent here? Well, users is a relation mapping accounts to users. So in this particular case, it's the mapping from account one to user zero. All right, so remember, that's what that users little bit is there. And what's, what's A? Well, we're looping, oh, well, not looping. We're doing kind of like a, a there exists. So we're sort of plucking out different accounts. So this could be one of the possible joins we're doing there, account one dot users. So what does that actually look like? So we've got, what is a dot users? Sorry, I should have made that top line a bit bigger. Gives us on the left side, a is the set containing just that single um, relation there. And on the right side is users, and users is just that one relation. 
Do those match the last column on the left side with the first column on the le right side? They do. You know, this is an inner join here. Toss away the matchy bit. Give us the result. We've got this, now this answer here, user 0. Right? So that's what a.users actually represents. And if you think about it, and I can talk to you about it later, you can actually conceptualize object-oriented programming the exact same way. Doing an attribute of access on an object, you can think of it identically to this. All right, so back to this. Let's look at another example. What is users? Well, we just saw that. Users is the relation from account 1 to user 0. What's resources? In this case, it's account 1 to resource 0 and account 1 to resource 1. So what would this give us? Tilde users, tilde is the transpose operator. So right out of the box, you can transpose stuff and flip things around. So what does this actually give us? Let's move all this stuff up to the top here. So tilde users is users flipped because it's the transpose. Resources is the same as before. Now we do our inner join just like we did. We only have one row on the left side, so we match its last column up with all the rows on the right side. And match is here, so we get that one. And match is here, so we get that one. And that's the answer to tilde users.resources. Now what does that actually mean? Like in English language, what does that join represent? Well, it actually represents the mapping of users to resources in the same account as the user. If you don't understand that, it's fine. But you can do some kind of interesting joins in Alloy, just like you can in a, relation, a relational database, right? And get some kind of interesting results out very easily, thanks to the power of the join operator. One more example. I know I said that account, with a capital A, is the set of all like, instances of account. We can do this one. And I actually had account.resources in the spec, and I told you to kind of ignore it. So that looks like this. Does this row match anything? No, it doesn't. Does this row match anything? Yep, it matches this one. So throw away the matchy bit. Just get resource 0. It matches this one, resource 1. And what does this actually mean? It's all the resources that belong to any account. All right, so we've essentially joined the entire accounts table with the mapping of accounts to resources, which gives us all the resources that belong to any account in the system. OK. Here's probably what you're all been waiting for. Time. How do you do time in Alloy? Because I didn't show any operations there, right? I just showed structures, data structures being generated, valid data structures. Well, time in Alloy is interesting because it's not a first class notion like it is in TLA. You have to actually create your own time sig. Mutable dynamic relations, they, ha they actually have to be things mapping to time. There's no such thing as mutability in Alloy. You have to do relations that vary over time. So if I were to change that spec we were looking at before, the first thing I'd have to do is I'd have to create this sig time at the top. And for reasons that don't matter too much right now, I'd have to pass it to the ordering module to do some other stuff. But this becomes boilerplate that you just memorize any time you want to do time. All right, what about our sigs themselves? How would they change if we want to allow them to vary over time, i.e., if we want to allow an account's resources to change over time, if we want to allow account's users to change over time? Well, what we get is this. So what before was a mapping from where resources were just set a res was just a set of resources. Now the resources attribute is a set of resources mapped to a set of time. So at different time points, you can have different sets of resources. Same thing with the users. We're now going to say at different time points, you can have different sets of users. Same thing down here, same thing down here. Basically, whenever you want to have variables, in Alloy, you have to map them over time. Now, that's also going to change our facts, because facts, in some ways, are overpowered. When you're talking about a structural diagram and what should be allowed, facts are great. But if we, let, let's say you had a, a TLA plus module where you could say, not only is my invariant something I want to check, but I'm going to force that invariant to always be true, and TLA plus will only ever explore cases where that invariant is true, that would be kind of useless, right? Like you're over-constraining it. You're forcing something to be true that you don't know if it should be true. So instead of a fact when we move to time, our fact is going to become a check. It's going to become an invariant check like we would do in TLA+. And it's, instead of for each user, we're going to look at for every pair of user and time. Instead of there should be exactly one account, we'll say there should be at most one account. Because sometimes users aren't going to be assigned to any account whatsoever. And then instead of the user belongs to the account, it's going to say the user belongs to the account at time t. 
And you can figure it out on paper yourself, but these dots are just more inner joins all happening together. Now, what about init, our favorite init in TLA plus? How does that look in alloy? Well, you create a predicate, and a predicate in alloy is like a, it's a Boolean valued function. So I guess it's what it is in, the, in all of math. It is a Boolean. <laughs> And it takes, it takes a time. And in, in particular, we're going to send it the first time. We're going to send it time zero. But it's going to say, at whatever time we pass it, there's going to be no accounts with resources at that time. And there's going to be no users anywhere at that, or no accounts having users at that time, and no users having resources at that time, and no parents, no parent relationships at that time. And what about this? Our good friend spec equals, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we kind of have to do this a little, bit, a little bit more manually, but we put it into a fact. And in the fact, we're going to have our init, just like we do in TLA+. And what's first? Where did that come from? Well, by using that ordering boilerplate, it injected the word first into the namespace, kind of, sort of, and it represents time zero. Just accept that. Trust me, I'm Canadian. Um, and then, so that's our init. Our time, what, what should be true at time zero. And then we're going to say, for every, other, for every point in time, except the last point in time, and last gets injected kind of like first does, and it represents the final bounded point in time. So for every point in time t, let t prime equal t dot next. And prime isn't reserved in alloy like it is in TLA plus, so people just tend to use it exactly like you do in alloy. So let, let, let t prime be the point in time that comes after t. There exists a u and user a and account are in resource, such that the add user operation, and I haven't shown you the operation yet, but such that the add user operation is true between those two points for the user and account, or add resource is true between those two points, or assign resource is true. And this is, like, if you squint your eyes a little bit, this is exactly what the TLA plus spec looks like. It's doing the same thing. We have a, a there exists and a whole bunch of actions ORed together. Uh, we do the same thing in Alloy. This is what the add user action actually looks like. It too is a predicate, taking two points in time. We're going to have an enabling condition, just like we do in TLI plus. So we're saying there should be no account A such that U belongs to that account at time T. Right? We, we only want to be able to add a user to an account if the user doesn't already belong to an account. That seems like a, a reasonable operation. So that's our enabling condition. You can only perform this add user if the user doesn't already belong to some other account. Here's the actual transition. The account's users at t prime should equal the account's users at time t plus u, very much like TLA plus there. Here's the really annoying part. The unchanged. Now, anyone that's written TLA plus for a long, a long time probably gets annoyed once in a while having to track all the unchanged stuff. Trust me, that is a much better world than what Alloy makes you deal with. Okay, much, much better. I love unchanged in TLA plus after spending time with Alloy because you basically have to figure out all the other things in the system, all the other relationships that aren't changing between those two points in time, and do a whole bunch of stuff. And it's very error prone. And it's not friendly like TLA plus when you get it wrong. I'll, I'll hopefully have time to show you that. All right, so let's actually run that spec. So I built, I didn't do all the work on it, but I started converting the spec we were working into a time-based spec. And I want to show you what it looks like to execute some of these. So I'm going to do a, a run operation, and it's going to generate an instance. All right, so this is some valid sequence of operations. And let's look at it. And that's nonsense, right? We can't, we can't actually look at that. Once time 0, time 1, time 2, time 3 get put in here, who even knows what that means? But fortunately, and I know you can't read this at the back, you can project any visualization over any of the variables. So we're going to project over time. I know you can't read this. This actually says time 0 down here where my mouse is. So at time 0, this is what all the data looks like. There's an account and a resource and two users, but none of them are connected together yet. I can click the little arrows here, and it will show me what the world looks like at time one. Well, at time one, user one belongs to account zero. So that means the add user operation took place between time zero and time one. At time two, both users belong to the account. So another add user operation has taken place. At time three, the resource belongs to it as well. So an add resource operation has taken place. 
So that's kind of cool. That's what time-based visualizations look like in Alloy. I have a separate run statement here. And this is a pretty neat thing. You can define different runs with their own sort of local constraints. So I, wanna, I want Alloy to generate a sequence of operations such that there is some point in time t and user for which the user has some resource at that point in time. So I want to see a sequence of operations that at some point has a user getting a resource, getting permissions on a resource. So execute that one there. We get our instance. So again, we're at time zero, nothing too interesting. At time one, the add user operation has taken place. At time two, the add resource operation has taken place. And at time three, the assign resource to user operation has taken place. So now we've got this nice assignment that we asked Alloy to generate for us. OK, so let's look at invariance with time. I have another check somewhere here, hopefully. Let's see. Yes, check no shared users. So this is an invariant. I don't even know where it is. No shared. How is it possible? That I, anybody see where it says no shared users here? Help from the class? Yeah, but I was giving it to me as an option. There we go. All right. So that's the invariance. No counterexample found. So you know, this is a version of a fact we had written earlier. Based on the model I've built right now, it's impossible for two accounts to have the same user because we have this enabling condition. right? The add user operation can only take place if the user doesn't already belong somewhere. So let's comment that out rerun the counterexample and see what happens. So now we get a counterexample found, and we can see what that looks like. So at time 0, you know, everything's just sitting there. At time 1, user 1 has been added to account 1. And at time 2, user 1 has been added to account 0, therefore violating our invariant, which is what we expect to happen when we delete our enabling condition. So that's what time-based instance generation and time-based invariance look like. I want to show you one last thing. Remember how I said unchanged is amazing in TLA plus versus Alloy? And it's totally true. Big reason, you know, obviously, this is super painful to write. I'm not even going to bother explaining it. But it's super painful to write compared to the unchanged in Alloy. In TLA plus, if you write an unchanged and you forget to include a variable, what happens? TLC tells you that you forgot to include that variable, right? It stops if it ever hits it and says, hey, you didn't define the behavior of this variable in the next state. But what happens if I forget an unchanged in alloy? So basically, I'm forgetting to mark it that resources shouldn't change if you're adding a user, right? If you're adding a user to the system, anything about resources should remain unchanged. Let's just generate a regular instance, not looking for a counterexample, just see a valid instance and see what happens here. At time 0, nothing's attached to anything. At time 1, well, user 1 has been added to account 0, but somehow these two resources have developed a parent-child relationship. I haven't even defined an operation yet for creating parent-child relationships. But because I didn't tell Alloy that between those two time steps, the resources should do nothing, Alloy is allowed to do anything between those two time steps. And it did do anything. It put this parent-child relationship, which I don't want and I don't like. So that's kind of a pain. All right. So let me talk about some of the experiences I've had modeling other people's systems in Alloy. Because I've done, I've done a lot of that. So people love the visualizer. And they love that notion of exploration. Like you're building your model. And al before you write a single invariant, Alloy is showing you things that are possible. And more often than not, you're going to find something weird in there that you didn't expect. So people. People love that. I'm people. I love that. <laughs> to, to outsiders, I'll say outsiders, um, the syntax feels more understandable. Like It looks like English, and you can kind of make sense of it. Uh, it's been my experience that most people are not familiar with the AND and OR operators in math that we use in TLA+. Like, most people don't know what that is. They just haven't seen it before, which is a surprise to me. But that's been my experience thus far. So Alloy like, feels more understandable. Um, Oftentimes, data modeling is more useful than operation modeling. Operation modeling, like we always do in TLA+, that is going to find wonderful, subtle bugs. And that is such a huge, important thing. 
but the ability to understand the possible data structures of your system without even worrying about the operations that get you there. Just putting constraints on about what should, what structure should be possible, that is hugely important. And I've found that more than 50% of the time, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I've got the data modeling in, in Alloy and not the operation modeling. Uh, I mentioned this before. What we, what we in the TLA Plus community like to call as basic math is, is not commonly understood. The AND and the OR operators, not understood. Sets, not understood. Most people think that sets are a way to eliminate, eliminate duplicates from a list. All right? Sets are much more than that, and most people don't understand that. And I showed you time-based specs are painful in Alloy. I've actually done incredibly useful things with time-based specs in Alloy, but you have to be very careful. All right, so I'm going to put these up quick. This is, there's actually a paper comparing Alloy to TLA+. I don't necessarily agree with their conclusions. I think they came out too much in favor of Alloy. I think they missed some, some things there, but it's a, it's a good read. Um, AlloyTools.org, that's the website to go to. The Daniel Jackson, who the creator of Alloy, he has an amazing chapter in the architecture of open source applications, and it's free, available online, describing um, cores, the browser cross-origin stuff, uh, and Alloy model they built for that. It's a fantastic, fantastic chapter. And of course, hello, Wayne. If you're interested in TLA+, Plus, if you're interested in Alloy, he's interested in both. I know he does corporate workshops on both. I know he does fantastic corporate workshops on both, so please seek him out. And I think that's the end of my resources. It is. All right, and I'm at time. Thank you. So, there was your arms. Everybody blown away. <laughs> she was first. If you had to give a guideline for when you choose to use Alloy versus TLA Plus, what would you say? What I tell most people is that I usually start in Alloy because I've, at least the systems I've worked with, I've found it more useful to understand the structure of the data. And then once I understand the structure, I find it, I, I want to just jump straight to TLA plus and look at the operations that allow that structure to be changed, um, which is kind of a crap answer because I'm telling you to use both. But like, ideally, you would have enough time to do Alloy and then TLA plus. But if the operations are most important, TLA plus. If the structure of the data is most important, then Alloy. So what does your environment look like where you get the benefits of both? Oh, kind, warm, loving. Uh, that you're going you're gonna to need that to, to get anyone to give you enough time to build not one, but two models in completely separate languages. And I, I've, never, I've never actually done that, where I did an Alloy and then I moved to TLA plus. Uh, I'll usually get a sense. Well, I, honestly, I almost always start things in Alloy because getting my head wrapped around the, the data structures I find super important at first. But usually, I'll be able to tell pretty quickly whether the structure is going to be important or whether the operations are going to be important. And then I'll, I'll jump to it. So I don't know if that really answers. I hope that answers your question. But you can try again. I can rephrase it. Um. I come from a relational database background, so like I saw this and thought, "Oh my gosh, this would be great for um, schema modeling." Um, and but I've also been interested. Clearly, I'm here for the TLA plus stuff. So seeing the operations aspects of it too, and I um, would like to figure out a way. Is there a way that I could um, have in the same environment that's looking at the same kind of facts and predicates and um, data structures and so they could be shared or complement each other at the same time rather than rewriting, but I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm I, new. So. I, I think it would, it would be a rewrite if you want to use both. Or, I mean, you do it in Alloy, and then you deal with the huge pain it is to write operations in Alloy. It's totally doable. People have done incredible things. Um, Alloy has, like, there's hundreds of papers out there on Alloy, which kind of blows my mind. Uh, and almost all of the useful ones seem to do time-based operations. So maybe I just really suck at it, but like, I don't know that that looked very pleasant to anybody else here. Uh, so if you have to, but you know, there's another way to say you can do time-based operations in Alloy. I think it's going to be tough to try to use both of them simultaneously for any long period of time. We can talk after, because I'm probably still not answering your question very well. <laughs> Is it possible to model liveness properties? Yeah, you can. Um, I didn't show. I didn't show all the time-based things you get in Alloy, but you can say things like, 
um, such and such should be true in a future point in time. Like, if something is true at this point in time, then at some point in the future, this other thing must be true. Uh, some liveness, or I think fairness stuff especially, would be difficult because Alloy is very bounded. I didn't even talk about that. Alloy really bounds you hard, not just on number of SIGs, but like number of time SIGs. So you're probably not going to have that many points in time that you can, you can work with, and that makes certain liveness stuff very difficult. Uh, but you can, you can do it. Okay. Right. Um, thanks again. Thank you.